thank you. It's lovely to be in New York. It's great to be here. So today I'm going to be talking a bit about uh, running and reading in real time, some of the things that we have been looking at uh, on the Minine, and I'll be thinking about squiggles. And I just want to do a little bit of uh, almost advertising at the beginning, talking about why we got into nanopore sequencing and what we've done. Uh, you all know about nanopore sequencing. You're here. You know it's cool. You know there are simple library preps. There's long reads. There's low prices. There's single molecule sequencing. And there's real-time data streams. And this is all incredibly uh, exciting. And that's why I got excited about the MinIron. And so I encourage people in Nottingham to apply for the map. And I think we have the record because I think we had 45 applications to map from Nottingham in the first round. Uh, and we got seven of them, um, which is really exciting. Um, but the problem was I promised to help everybody analyze their data. And along comes these fast five format files, which we just, I didn't know what to do with them at first. And in fact, what we did was we opened them up in HDFU, we copied out the uh, sequence, and we blasted it. Uh, and it was incredibly exciting because it matches. Uh, to the reference, and that's incredible for this little portable device. And then you think, what am I going to do with this? And what about real time? Blasting reads one at a time isn't real time. So we built this thing, which is Minotaur. Uh, and Minotaur <coughs> is a web platform that will analyze your data for you in real time as it comes back from the sequencer. It shows you things like read lengths in real time. So we're looking at an uh, Amplicon run here. Uh, it shows them over time. It aligns them to the reference, uh, and you get coverage plots, and, and all sorts of fun things. Uh, and I've probably not got time to let this video play out. But what else can you do with it? You can export fast A and fast Q from it in real time. You get plots there showing you the way that the flow cell is performing, information about how base calling is going, hopefully anything you want within reason uh, you can look at in Minotaur. So Minotaur is available, so you can click on a on a uh, column there showing you the length of reads, and you can get all the 2KB reads you want to look at. So there's lots of things in Minotaur, uh, and I'd encourage you to get in touch if you, if you want to use this. You can even look at um, coverage uh, by uh, color-coded there by base across the reference. So uh, lots of things that you can see, and I'll move on from that. What can you use Minotaur to do in real time? Well, there's all sorts of things you might want to look at in real time. You might want to look at the amount of sequencing depth you've got, so just general global sequencing depth. Uh, targeted sequencing, I'll try this. Here we are. So barcodes, looking at different uh, levels of barcodes, perhaps rates of sequencing, or even if you found a specific variant uh, in your uh, sample. But how do you get away from the fact that you have to look at a website to do this? Well, you make the website tweet you when uh, you've reached a particular uh, depth of coverage. And so that's uh, what Minotaur does. It will send you messages when certain conditions have been reached. Uh, and then this one came through on Friday afternoon, so I wasn't in the lab. So I have to phone Sunir and ask him to do something. This is Sunir, who's fantastic, uh, doing all the library prep. But really, it would be nice to get rid of Sunir um, so that you don't need him to do anything. Uh, and this is kind of a little bit something that, that uh, Nanopore have described, this idea that you can do some real-time analysis and then change the question, do something different, uh, and change the way that your experiment's running. So we've tried to build that in. So this is uh, a little video that's just showing two-way communication now between Minotaur uh, running on one computer and Minno running on another computer. You can see a message in the top right-hand corner telling you that Minotaur is interacting with your run, and it's at your own risk. I take no responsibility if it does go wrong. Uh, you enter a PIN number, uh, and you access some new features here, uh, which give you uh, stats coming back from Minno. Uh, it gives you the option to send messages back to make sure it's working. There's one just appeared. You can rename your run. You can change that on the fly. You can change the voltages. You can start and stop different library scripts. Um, there's lots of things uh, that you can do in here. So this is just showing you uh, changing a run. And again, I've not got time to show you all of this. Um, but you are welcome to play with it uh, and welcome to have a go. And it's great because it means that you can, uh, you can see the, the name has changed up there. And in fact, it's two-way. So if you change the name in, in Minno, it will update back on the website for you as well. Minno is a great piece of software, by the way. <laughs> the guys who've written it are incredible. Um, I'm not just saying that. I've had a look at it, and I just wish I could write things as good as that. 
Anyway, so you can do all of those things. It's brilliant. What that means is that you can uh, go out and watch a film, uh, and whilst you're out at the cinema, you can take control of your sequencer, and you can change the run and do things about it. And actually, some of the data I'm showing you in a moment, uh, I was actually generating that data whilst watching, uh, I think this was the new Bond film. Um, the sequencing was more exciting than the Bond movie. <laughs> So now what I want to talk to you about is something else that uh, Nanopore introduced, and, and Clive spoke about this uh, in 2014, this idea uh, about read and till. Being able to look at reads uh, as they actually pass through uh, the Nanopore, uh, and then do something with them. So choose whether to sequence them uh, or not. Uh, and I thought this was an absolutely astonishing idea. Uh, it was amazing uh, that we might be able to implement it. Uh, and so, in order to do that, you have to look at squiggles, because you're not getting base called data, you're getting individual squiggles coming back. So I started looking at squiggles and started playing with squiggles. And we came up with an idea for looking at barcoded data. Um, and this was just, just playing around, really, this idea that you might be able to take a model squiggle, compare it with a read coming in, and then choose whether or not to sequence that. Uh, and so we did this just on, this is real nanopore data, but this isn't running read and till. Uh, at the top, you've got coverage coming in uh, for individual reads. This is the same data set. The top is just watching that data as it's generated. Uh, the bottom is watching that data, and we're stopping sequencing once we reach 20x coverage. And you can see we've ugh, gone too quickly, sorry. Uh, we reached that very quickly. The video won't play now, but the, the top video takes a lot longer. And in fact, it takes about 700 reads to get 20x coverage and 350 reads to get 20x coverage if you're running read and till. So we were able to do this just looking at squiggles. And about that time, those of you in the previous session would have heard Josh talking about Ebola and sequencing Ebola. Uh, and so I got a little bit sidetracked for a bit because we wondered whether we could use our ability to map squiggles uh, to help in the uh, Ebola uh, sequencing project. Uh, and essentially what they were doing was amplifying 11 different amplicons uh, across the Ebola genome. And what you can see here is you get very different coverage of those uh, Ebola amplicons. And so we thought perhaps we can help. They were having to send this data back from West Africa. There's about 5,000 reads here, when really all they needed was 25x coverage over each amplicon, uh, which is about 275 reads. So we could really help on their mobile phone bills. They were shipping this data back over 3G initially. And so can we pre-map the reads in squiggle space? Well, the top is showing you uh, base called reads, and the bottom plot is showing you just looking at the squiggles. So this isn't base called data. If I remove the template and complement and look at what we're calling 2D, you can see that these align really, really nicely. Uh, and so we're able to uh, identify where reads were mapping to. And then it's not a big step to go from there to try and identify the good 2D portion of this run. This is showing you the 2D reads. Uh, and to be able to select just those, uh, and this is giving us uh, 25x coverage across the genome. Uh, and so I think, Josh, actually, people did use this a little bit, and then you got a lot better uh, broadband connection, and it was better just to ship the whole data back. But this is all doing it after the sequencer, and what we really want to do is do it on board the sequencer. And so we've had a go at implementing this using the uh, Nanopore API. Uh, and essentially, the raw data gets event called, and then you can look at that, and you can decide whether to accept the read, in which case it's written to disk, or reject the read, in which case uh, the read will actually be spat out of the sequencer. Uh, it'll be uh, shot back out of the pore. And we decided to start easy with Lambda. And we chose just two regions from Lambda, uh, two 5KB regions that we wanted to sequence. Uh, and we started the sequencer running. And the plots on the left here are showing you the blue is template, the orangey color is complement, and the yellow is 2D. This is obviously sped up. And if it looks slow now, it was incredibly slow when I was watching it, waiting to see if anything would happen. But what you can see are these two peaks starting to emerge here uh, from this library. And those peaks are from 10 to 15 KB uh, and 30 to 35 KB. These were the two regions that we were selecting when running uh, read and till. So here they are. Uh, they're starting to, to grow really nicely now. And I'll just jump ahead in time and show you uh, what that run looked like at the end and highlight a couple of points to you. 
the boxes show you the 5 kb regions that we were selecting and you can see those peaks are quite nice there's some spread well the average read length of this library was 5 kb and a read mapping anywhere within this box we're going to keep so you end up with coverage either side the other issue here though is of course that we've got uh, a maximum of about 1250 1300x but our minimum is only 500x so what's happening is the read until leaky uh, no uh, it isn't because read until lets you talk to each channel individually and so we were actually testing here to make sure that everything worked and so we were addressing odd numbered channels and even numbered channels separately so let's look at the data that was just coming back from the odd numbered channels uh, and here's the data coming back from the odd numbered channels and essentially there's no real enrichment here and that's because we weren't selecting so the library that we have in there gives us pretty much uniform coverage over the 48 KB of the Lambda genome. There's something slightly low at the start, but it's pretty much uniform. And if we have a look at that after it's been left for a long time, other than this little dip at the beginning, there's no significant enrichment over these regions. So the library contains all the molecules. If we then look at the even channels, uh, and we do the same thing, just play back that uh, again. It takes a minute or two to see uh, the emergence of the enrichment, but it will uh, start to appear uh, in a moment confidently. I've seen this video before. It does start to appear. There it is. Uh, and so you can see we're, we're sequencing the same uh, library here on the same flow cell. We've just divided the flow cell virtually, if you like, into two halves, uh, the odd and even channels. And there is the enrichment starting to happen. So we are selecting the reads that we want, and we're rejecting the reads that we don't want. And I'll let that go. Here it is at the end. You can see we've got about a thousand, just greater than a thousand fold coverage on the regions that we're interested in. Uh, and that bar is too thick. It should be thinner than that. That's my fault in preparing the slides. But almost zero coverage in the regions outside. So read until works. It works on lambda here. Can we apply it in the Ebola type uh, situation uh, on amplicons? Let's just return to this. Uh, just to finish up here. So this is the 11 Amplicon strategy. Um, sequencing Ebola, uh, as has been mentioned earlier, is hard. It's difficult to find places that you can legally do it, certainly in the UK. And so we didn't uh, sequence Ebola initially. Uh, we started working with Lambda, uh, and we just reproduced the strategy. So here is an 11 Amplicon uh, library on Lambda. Uh, you can see each of those Amplicons and the coverage, and you can see this library uh, has differential amplification of those amplicons. We let this run for a bit, and then we stopped the sequencer, and we decided to uh, see if we could selectively sequence different amplicons. Uh, and so just to get a nice pattern, we started off, same library, restarting the flow cells, just sequencing the odd-numbered amplicons. So we won't sequence any of the even-numbered amplicons. We'll leave those out. And this is exactly the same library, same flow cell, Nothing changed except we're applying read until, and you can see that we can nicely select uh, just one subset of the amplicons. And just to prove there's nothing uh, fishy going on here, we then flip to the other half, uh, and we just carried on sequencing, but now we ask for the even numbered amplicons. And it takes a moment for these graphs to appear normally. That's a, a funny coding bug in Minotaur that doesn't show the coverage plots properly yet. But now you can see it. Uh, we're just sequencing the even amplicons. So we can selectively choose which amplicon we want to look at. We can amplify those. We can choose when we want to reject them uh, and when we don't. Uh, and so we've got this really nice uh, up-down pattern uh, that we can get. One of the things you might be able to see is that this uh, lower run here, the even amplicons, they're almost all at the same coverage depth. And this is what we're trying to get working now is counting these reads uh, so we can actually essentially let you say I want 100 copies of Amplicon 1, 100 of Amplicon 2, and so on, all the way through, get a perfectly normalized uh, library. And I think we're two flow cells away from doing that, um, but I'll, I'll let you know uh, at some point soon. So uh, this now can be applied to Ebola, and we've started trying that out, and we just need to sort out this counting problem um, to really nail that. And then you can enrich for anything. Um, what about performance on this? Well, I'll give you a few rough figures at the moment for what we think we can deal with. Um, we, can, we can do 25 different amplicons easily. Uh, we can do that uh, on a couple of thousand channels, so synthetically looking at this. So, that, so that's pretty good. And all of that is running 
on the laptop at the same time uh, as Minno is sequencing. Uh, there's, there's plenty of room for improvement, but, but it's an amazing uh, uh, thing to be able to play with and do. So uh, I've just got a few comments to wrap up. I think I'm still on green. That's really good. I've not run out of time. Yeah, matching squiggles to a reference is a difficult problem. Um, I've not dwelt too much on exactly the methods we're using. I'm not sure whether they're the right methods uh, to go uh, ahead with, but it, it is doable, it is possible. Run until experiments are achievable. You can set goals and you can change the sequencer and we've built that, that's the Minotaur stuff. Read until works. The phenomenal technology uh, that really excited me when I first uh, heard about it actually works. Getting this to work on large genomes is going to be a challenge. So whenever anybody hears about read until working, uh, they say to me, I want to remove human from my sample, for example. Um, and, and I, yeah, that, I can't do that yet. Um, but I think it is achievable. We just don't have the methods quite yet. But this Amplicon-based sequencing approach uh, absolutely works. This is an application that can be rolled out uh, pretty soon. Um, so. Great. Uh, where, where can you get Minotaur? We've got a version working in Nottingham. You can register to use that and play with it. Uh, it's on GitHub as well, so you can download it and install it for yourselves. Uh, we are going to put it up in the Amazon cloud as well. There's a number of people at Nottingham who've helped. Martin, Sunir, and Mike, and Birmingham, Nick Lohman, and Josh uh, Quick, and many others. And then lots of people at Oxford Nanopore who I'm sure uh, I've left some names off here, but who've been incredibly helpful. Thank you very much for listening. Happy to take any questions. For your read until method, uh, are you are you simply using alignment, or are you using a K-merge strategy? Just using look? alignment at the moment. Yeah, I mean, for read until you want you want to be able to map in as short a number of events as possible, right? Because the faster you can make that decision, the better you can make the benefit gained from running read until. Um, so at the moment, we're going from about 250 events. Um, you can probably get to less than that. I just haven't had the confidence. Yeah, to try it, but I'm sure we can get to less than that. Hi, could you share with us some uh, uh, why it is difficult to match up the squiggles to the reference genome? What problems have you had? Uh, so, um, how do you how do you match a squiggle where uh, the squiggle is shifted in? Uh, in various different ways with respect to the model. So we, we can build a model reference genome, but then you have to compensate for shift, for scale, for drift, um, for the fact that you get sometimes missed uh, events. Uh, so, you, so there's a lot to take into account. And then there is the simple problem of searching through a very, very large sequence, a squiggle space, where the alphabet is very, very large as well. So 1,024 different event values, or in fact more than that now on the Sigma model, it is, it's tricky. So the, this taste, I'm gonna call it tasting, I guess, does that consume, like when you, when you taste the, the fragment and spit it back out, does that consume, I guess, flow cell potential? No, I call it? no, no, not at all. So you, okay, so you, so then you can, if, if something <laughs> is, you hit the coverage target that you want, you can then boost everything up and sort of select against that. Uh, yes, hopefully. yes. So that's one of the things that I've been trying to look at and, and see how well that works. But yes, once you're rejecting something, you're, you're not losing anything from the flow cell other than, I guess, the time it takes to eject that read. You can't sequence then, but I don't see any evidence <coughs> of any other issues. So how long does it take to call the uh, basis for the 250 base pair? Sorry? How long does it take to call the basis? To call the basis? Yes. So you, you do base calling first, right? You oh, no, no, no. I'm not base calling at all. Ah, you're matching the squiggle space. I'm matching in squiggle space. So I don't, I don't waste time base calling. <laughs> uh, I just go straight through the squiggles. Since we don't waste time, uh, basically, but I'm wondering um, how fast is the algorithm and in terms of um, the fast mode coming up? Is it? 
So yeah, I, I'm one content. of the few people who don't want fast mode. <laughs> Um, that's, that's not true. Fast mode, um, no, actually it is true. I don't want fast mode yet. <laughs> fast mode will be a challenge, uh, as will uh, expansion of, of larger capacity flow cells, as will running on Promethion. These things are all, uh, all very, very difficult um, to resolve. In Lambda, I'm placing reads in um, 0.3 of a second, something like that, um, so, so fairly quickly. Um, but it's definitely something that, it certainly keeps me awake at night, uh, as I'm sure it keeps other people awake at night as well. So for the reference, uh, you're using the hidden Markov model values that are stored by Metricor, is that correct? Yes, yes, okay. that's right. 